Amen, Pastor. Yeah, Thank you so much, sir. Who's, who's my timekeeper? Yeah, you're good. Who's, so, Dirt, yeah. Dirt? Yeah. good, good. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to first honor your pastor and his partner in ministry, his wife. I honor you all. I'm humbled and happy to be here. I'm humbled because I realize I don't deserve this opportunity, but I'm happy because I like doing it. <laughs> what a dichotomy. I like this, but I know I don't even deserve to do it. Amen. And if I don't think any of us deserves to be saved. Lord, yeah, yeah, yeah. But to be in his service, that's like bonus, you know. <laughs> you save me and you're going to use me. You think I'm worthy to be used? It's, wow. it's amazing. So, yeah. honor you guys. Good to be here. Yeah. Honor Bishop Johnson yeah. All right. yeah. from Maryland. We just our first time meeting. We're both yeah. in Maryland. So, hopefully, this won't be our last time right. uh, fellowshipping together. My brother's with me. Uh, amen. He hasn't. He he's the chairman of our deacon board. We're still trying to get him saved. Yeah, yeah. Amen. <laughs> That's a good chairman. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, Father. Please speak to us. Give life during this time. Give us what we need, and uh, we avail this time to you. And thank you so much for it. Thank you for the flexibility to be here. Thank you for child care and and leave from work and and. <laughs> A job, being self-employed, whatever it is that has enabled us to be here today, we honor you for it, and we pray that our coming would not be in vain, but that we will receive a greatly. Open us up. May we be open to receive from you today. Whatever it is you want us to hear, to see, to receive, we're open to it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this is the breakout conference. Breakout. Breakout. I like that. I want to say that over this time we'll be together this morning, it would be most important for me to help you as best I can. So during the course of this time, if you have a question, then please feel free to ask it. Because it, 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 for me to just be up here talking would not be as helpful as answering a question that you came here with. Yeah. So we want to get, get, make sure you had that liberty. When I was in the sanctuary, looking at your beautiful place and what a beautiful place this is, and uh, Brother Jomo was praying about this breakout, mm. I, I, I felt like the Lord was saying, there cannot be a breakout without a break in. Mm. Like, before there's a breakout of growth, and ministry and effectiveness out of my life. He's got to break in to a space that needs to be broken. You know God doesn't use anything that ain't broken. If God says if, if you want to bump a crop, you got to break up the fallow ground. When Jesus, before he served communion, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. Good. Then he passed it out. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You have to be broken before he can pass you out. Oh, Lord. Some of us can't be consumed because it's too much us. Oh. Come on now. Come on. So there has to be a breaking of me yeah. Yeah. before he can give the wine out in communion. Mm. The grapes have to be crushed because mm. you can't drink grapes. Mm. <laughs> All right, and some of us, our ministries can't be received because there's too much us in the way. God's got to crush you. Yeah. Before he smears you with his oil, he must smash you like an olive and break you so much that you leak oil. <laughs> there's, that, that's the necessity of a breakout. There must be a breaking because there's an inner me, an inner me that does not want to please God. I don't care how saved you are. There's something in you that ain't right. I've been in, I ain't new to this. <laughs> There's something in everybody. You can act like you ain't nothing broken in you. It's something in us that ain't right. It's something in us that the blood didn't fix, the, count, the cross didn't fix, being filled with the Holy Ghost, none of that fixed it. It's something wrong with us. I ain't, how many of you know there's something so wrong with you that if that thing ever get loose, 
out. <laughs> We'd have to call the National Guard to check you. Amen. How many, I, I, I better just stay still because I'm going to fall off this stage. Let me put this right here so I won't cross that line. How many of you come to church because you know God's got to keep me? Amen. I don't just come to serve him. I come to keep that thing in me. Because some of us, all of us are ex-something. Right, right? And if you are ex-anything, you have the capacity to revisit what you were. The biggest freaks, the biggest pimps, the biggest hustlers all up in here. You know why I know that? That's where leaders come from. We led in the world, we lead in the church. That's how we are. I was the biggest sinner too, you understand what I'm saying? So there is a capacity in us that, that inner me. God is always fighting the enemy, even if the enemy is my inner me. That's where the breaking has to come. That's where the crushing has to come. And God breaks before he delivers, before he uses people. Anybody that God is going to greatly use, he's going to gravely bruise. So that out of that broken, I had a, when I, when I got married, my wife and I have been married 27 years now. My wife, amen. She tried to leave, but I followed her. <laughs> and when we first got married, um, and I'll tell you about our church so you'll know, like, if that matters. But when we first got married, we got, one of the gifts that we got for our wedding gift was these lamps. And I talk about it in a book that I wrote called Second Chance, Grace for the Broken. And in this lamp, these were green lampshades and the lampshades were like glass covered, but it was a dark green. And so it was pretty cool when you would cut the light on, the lampshade would make the room kind of have this green feel to it. Yeah. I thought it was kind of sexy myself, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know, us men, we think everything's sexy. Everything, everything. Ain't that sexy, babe? So, so, amen, amen. We can get anything back to that, amen. All, all roads lead to that. For sure. So, um, so, so one, somehow I knocked my lamp. See, she had one on her nightstand, one on, I had one on my nightstand. The one on my side, I knocked over one time and it broke the lampshade. It cracked it open. It was a bit of a hole in it. And so we put it back up and we turned the lampshade so that if you walked in our room, you couldn't see the hole. The hole was in the back. You know how we hide stuff, right? So we only had a one bedroom apartment, but we took people through it and stuff. And we would all have that lampshade. And I, but, about, but one of the things I appreciated about that lampshade was the fact that it was broken. In the area where it was broken, more light came out of it. Who y'all missed that? That was good right there. So, 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 so at night, like beside me to the bed was a closet and all that area we would cut off, that would, that would be dark. And so if I ever needed to have a light at night, I cut that light on and I turn that lamp around with a hole in it and it'd be like a flashlight. And then when I wanted to lay in bed and read, I turn it towards me and it'd be like a reading light. But all the light that came from it came from his brokenness. And the things that we want to throw away to God is one. When God sees something broken, like we got a broke down car, we out there kicking the tires on the road. We got a broken TV, we throwing stuff at it and it don't work. When God sees something broken, he gets excited. I can use that. I can use that. See, if God was to make this stool, he wouldn't make it with four legs. That's too stable. That's too, that's too stable. God would make it with three legs. So that, so that when you try to set it here, he has to be what's missing. See, some of y'all already know what I'm talking about. He's what's missing in your life. You, you can't even sit there and act like you got it all together. You know you're too crazy, you're too nasty, you're too angry, you're too fearful, you're too intimidated, you're too whatever. He's what's missing. And he will keep that limp in that empty space, in that broken space, space in our life so that we're usable. So that I think in any ministry, in any minister, if there's going to be a break out, there must be a break in that causes me to be broken so that God can do work at another level. Now, when it comes to levels of leadership, Samuel Chan says your leadership will always grow at the level of your pain tolerance. 
This is not something that we typically talk about in leadership. We have principles for leadership and we have 10 steps to grow in a church and five steps to go into the next level. But we don't talk about pain. Sam Chan is an, is an international consultant for business leaders and church leaders. And he says he doesn't know of any mega organizational leader who doesn't live with immense pain. Some pain too personal to express. There's pain in their body. There's pain in their mind. There's pain of limited resources. There's pain of a vision that won't let you go. There's pain of people who don't keep up with you. And people who always find problems in everything you're trying to do. There's personal pain. There's children that ain't acting right in your house. There's marital pain. There's the pain of never being off. <laughs> never being off. Even when you're off, you ain't off. There's that, that pain. And, 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 and so he says, you grow, your organization and ministry will grow at the level that you can tolerate pain. So when you say, ouch, that's where it stops. Don't be talking about you want to grow. I want my ministry to grow. I want my church to grow. You can't, if, it, if you can't handle that level of hurt, that level of pain, that level of demonic activity, that level of stress and anxiety. There's a couple in our church that just got married over the weekend. And the reason why it's so popular is because the guy proposed to the lady at noon and married her at six. It's called the Forever Duncan story. It's trending on like some social media pages. And so... When I talk to them a few days after, they've already been on several shows, been called to be on the Ellen Show, the Steve Harvey Show. It's like, it's really, really popular. Yeah. But what is also popular is all the criticism that they're taking and all the hatred. And I said, and I said you know, they had this dream as a couple of changing the world and making a difference. I said, when, you're, when, you're, when you grow and God elevates you or you have some kind of breakout in your life, in your career, in your business, in your ministry, in your finances, the thing you have, to, one side of managing is managing all the success yeah. and the popularity and the demands on you and the invitations and the, the people who want to do business with you and the people who didn't notice you before, now everybody wants your card. You understand what I'm saying? So you got to manage all of that. But then there's something else you got to manage as you go up. You got to also manage haters and jealousy and criticism. And that's a management that we don't want. And people that just want something from you. So with growth comes this pain that comes with success and you will grow at the level of your pain tolerance whatever your marriage everything in your life will grow at the level that you can manage pain some people just say uncle and quit i can't take this anymore i wanted the success i wanted the numbers but i didn't want the drama that came with it pain everybody say pain so sometimes you got to preach hurt you had to teach hurt. Yeah. You got to lead men's group hurt. Yeah. You got to cook food hurt. Yeah. You got to lead worship hurt. Yeah. Yeah. You got to play instruments hurt. Yeah. You got to run the soundboard hurt. Yeah. You got to greet and do parking lot stuff hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Personal pain, good, spiritual pain, relational pain, all that's going on. And here you are standing on three legs. And the only thing that's letting you minister is the grace of God. Yeah. That's it. I ain't talking about that grace that only saves and pardons sins. I'm talking about a grace that enables. Yeah. The 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says it's a grace that makes your, makes your strength perfect in your weakness. The grace that makes your strength perfect in weakness. So you will have your, your growth in, in life and in ministry and in business is always proportionate to your tolerance of pain. You show me a great leader, a successful person, they got a lot of pain. I also want to uh, thought about this. There's a paradox in leadership, too. And I just want to say some things. I want to try to say some things that that are not necessarily novel, but maybe something you hadn't thought of that right. way. Yeah. You know, sometimes we need reiteration of things we already know. Yeah. Like we need to be reminded. Oh, I love that. That this is a place where people belong. They believe and we deal with their behavior. I love that. I'm going to steal that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just, listen, you, you already know. I already told you I'm going to steal it. So ain't no need you being mad. I told you in front of your people I'm stealing that. <laughs> I mean, ain't no need to have no beef. I ain't told you in front of everybody I'm stealing it. Right? <laughs> so, so, so there's a paradox of leadership. And the paradox of leadership is what I call 
the alpha and omega of leadership. Just write that down. The alpha and omega of leadership. It is, so alpha is first. Omega is the end. Jesus is alpha and omega. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and he's the ending. He is preeminent alpha, first king, ruler, greatest. He is omega, last, servant, humble. And as a leader, you got to be both. Jesus is so alpha that when he's riding in Jerusalem on a donkey, they're laying out palms and crying Hosanna because he's alpha. He's preeminent. He's king. He's Lord. He's first. But moments after he gets off the donkey and walks upstairs into the upper room, he washes the feet of his disciples because he's also Omega. <laughs> He's the last. And I can wash the feet of those who are about to abandon me. I can wash the feet of people who I already know are going to let me down. That's Omega right there. He is so alpha. He is so alpha. He can walk into the temple and see that the money exchanges are defiling the temple and go into alpha mode and turn over tables and pull out a whip and run people out. And then when his temple is being violated and they're spitting on him, good God, and they're mocking him, he says not a word because he's also okay. And what I'm saying is, as a leader, you got to be both. Look at somebody say, you got to be both. See, this is why I say it, because a lot of people are good at alpha. They walk in alpha. Where's my parking space? Who's in my seat? If you call him Angela, they say, I'm, I'm Evangelist Angela. You call him Pastor, they say, I'm Bishop. You call him Bishop, I'm Archbishop. They, uh, we got people who are good at Alpha. Alpha, they Alpha all day, running it, in charge, large. I do you know who I am? Speak to me, I don't speak to you. You understand what I'm saying? And they need help being Omega. Can you follow? Can you serve? There are times in my church when I'm leading, and it's clear, there are meetings that I walk in that I must follow. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a leader that's been put in place, and I need to get behind their agenda, as long as it doesn't conflict mine. But you understand what I'm saying? Y'all know I'm trying to, I ain't trying to be stupid. But I'm trying to be Omega here. I'm trying to be willing to serve. I'm the pastor, but I can park some cars too, and I can do this too, and we can help pick up trash too. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Then there are people who are all Omega. Yeah. Some of you are all Omega. Yeah. You love being Omega. You just want to serve. I'm just a humble servant. Yeah, yeah, That's all yeah. I am. I just want to be in the background, just want to be serving. But when it's time to stand up and lead yeah. and be Alpha. You shrink because you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings and you don't want to make any enemies. And I'm saying if you're going to lead, you got to be both. Look at somebody in the face and say, you got to go both ways. <laughs> After we done stood here holding hands. <laughs> that was real awkward, Pastor. <laughs> the Jesus in me, that was real awkward. I don't know him like that. <laughs> Somebody say, Lord, help me to be both. You got to know when to be both. When do, when, do I turn in, when do I turn into alpha without being arrogant? How can I be alpha and still be humble? Let me, let me tell you a little secret. How many of y'all preach in here? Preach every periodically. Preach. One of the signs that I am operating in my flesh. This is gonna really shock you. It shocked me. I'm still wrestling with it, it's so shocking. So I risk saying it to y'all, because I haven't really, really, really walked with this a long time. This is a new thought for me. 
I think it's a revelation that I'm walking in my flesh when I'm scared to minister. Oh, wow. Now watch this. Let me stay with me for a second. Because when I'm scared to minister, it's a revelation that I'm more concerned about me than I am about y'all. If I love you, perfect love. Y'all read the Bible up here? Perfect love cast out fear. You ain't scared of nobody you love. Mm. Wow. I don't care if your child on drugs, that's your son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your baby on drugs acting crazy, acting crazy. You ain't scared of him. Come here, Jojo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you love him. Yeah, yeah. Our ministry's got to be out of love. Yeah, yeah. I'm not here to perform. I love you. Mm. I love you. I don't even know you. Yeah. When I'm scared, I'm more concerned about my performance. You understand what I'm saying? Wow. What would they think of me? Oh, wow. Will they invite me back? Wow. Did I live up to their expectations? Yeah. Does it matter? Yeah. Oh, wow. If God wants to speak through me to you, mm. then I need to be in the love relationship with God to say, I join you in loving on your people. Yeah. Yeah. Period. Yeah. This ain't got nothing to do with me. Yeah. You can have anybody do this. And you gotta, you gotta keep staying in that place. Whenever you're scared, that's a side note, whenever you're scared to minister, ask yourself the question, is it more about me than them? Do so you up all night tossing turns, oh, I hope I do good now, don't want me to write this, write this, write this. And is, okay, so you are afraid of failing mm -hmm. in how they will make you look. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it making sense now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right, I'll, 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 I'll pause here. Anybody got any questions or? Yeah. or Comments, concerns, criticisms, pushback, arguments. In old Baptist church, they say, all hearts and minds clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's, yes, sir, Bishop. Can I steal back? What's that? <laughs> hey, Bishop, once you tell somebody you stole it, it's stolen. <laughs> you good, Doc. Yeah. So this paradox of Alpha and Omega also translates into another paradox of leading and managing. Mm. Leading and managing, leading and managing. Most people who are leaders by nature treat managers like they're not valuable. So when you hear talks on leadership and management, it almost elevates leadership above management as if management is less important. I would say that they're equally important. My brother and I flew here last night from Maryland. He was on the right side of the plane, near the right wing. I was on the left side of the plane, near the left wing. Let me ask you a question. Which wing on the plane is most important? Yeah, I think we better have both of them working. Leadership and management are wings on the plane of an organization. They must both be great. The difference between a leader and a manager is how they process, how they think. A leader functions from the future to the present. Leaders function from the future to the present. Y'all got that? A manager functions from the past to the present. Leaders, watch this. One is dream driven, the other is data driven. You got that? So managers are married to the data. This is the trend, Pastor. We can't do this because last time we did it, we don't have enough money for that. And that's called breaks. Every organization needs gas and breaks. See, we don't appreciate the breaks in the company, but the breaks keep you from crashing. But the gas keeps you from coming stagnant. Right, 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 right. Nice. Yeah. Is, that, is this helping anybody? Yeah. 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 I need to dial this back. Are y'all good? good. The leader, on the other hand, is comfortable in the unknown. Yeah. Leaders live in a world of fantasy. That's why they're so frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Their dream frustrates you. A, leader, a, leader's, a leader's vision will frustrate a manager. But both are, both. You right, preacher. Am I preaching? That's when you throw a 20 on the stage, right? 
<laughs> and a manager's policies and procedures and processes frustrate the leader. You put a leader who's already in the future in an org chart meeting and they will want to commit suicide. When I get in those kind of meetings that are like, they just dealing with systems and structure and all that, I be in there, I just start cracking jokes because I can't focus. <laughs> I start fights, then y'all got to fix them. I start, go, we going to get this land. <laughs> then y'all figure out how to pay for it. Watch this, watch this. Leaders, all about what? Managers, all about how. And when there's a trust that the leader is tracking with God, then the managers take their responsibility to say, well, we got to track with the leader. It is your job to solve the problems that a leader creates by the immense nature of their vision. Yes, sir. Would you say that Moses and Bezalel and Oliab is a great paradigm of that? Say that again. Is that Exodus 34, 35? That sounds like a good example. I'm not, I'm, I'm not as familiar with it, but that sounds like a good example. Yeah. About who? John Elway and Gary Kuzio. You really gotta know about him, Another example. Another example? I mean, y'all the champs. I mean, what can I say? Y'all the champs. Man. What can I say? You know, I think it's terribly interesting that uh, I do these sports minutes back home, and I did one on Brock Osweiler, who uh, who 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 was offered seventy-two million dollars to play for Houston. Is that right? Seventy-two million, and he said he was doing it because it was a better opportunity. <laughs> Hey, it's a better system. Are you serious? You're going to lead this defense for a better opportunity? That was about money. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And people get mad when other people go for that money, but we did the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I don't know the dynamic between John Elway and, and Kubiak, though, but something's working. Yeah. Yeah. Something's working. Yeah. But, but understanding... This, these two areas, management and leadership, should not compete. They should complete. That we're not in competition. And, and one of the things that's good is, is if you understand, one, one of the things I do with organizations, we wouldn't have time to do that today, is we go through a, an assessment so that people understand their wiring. Are you a natural uh, problem solver? Are you a goal-oriented person? Or are you an opportunity seeker? There are differences in how people are wired and, 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 and a lot of times how they're viewed in a leadership setting. Yeah. Yeah. How they're viewed in a leadership setting, because if you get a room, if you got a room and you got a couple of dreamers who are dominant in their, their personality and they're charismatic in their leadership, they tend to they tend to cast vision in such a way that if you question it, it's as if you're questioning God. So you tend to shut up even though what you're hearing doesn't make sense. And it's not that it's not a, it's, 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 you see, because there's a spiritual component to vision, but there's also a pragmatic component. Because you can have a vision, but you still got to talk to the county. And you still got to get, you still got to get zoning and you still got to get permits. You understand what I'm saying? You talk about Jesus all you want. Look, Steve, you're going to see if it's going to work. Yeah. Well, you go down to the government, you go down to, to, the, to the, to the, you know, yeah. peoples. They don't talk Bible. Yeah. They ain't talking Eliab or none of them people you just named. Yeah. They, you, they don't speak in tongues either. You know what they talk? They, they talk, they talk, they talk P&L statements. Yeah. 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 They talk, uh, 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 what's the thing called? Where you got to put a plan together. And, uh, Architectural yeah, yeah, they talk that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you got to have people on your team. I don't talk none of that. Yeah. I talk vision, Doc. Yeah. Yeah. This is where we're going. We're charging this hill. And I just think it's important to understand that paradox and to enjoy it, be able to laugh about it and not be so upset about it. That's how God made him, that's how God made me, and together we're gonna to be a great, we're gonna be a great plane for this organization. All right? Any other questions? I thought I saw yes, Pastor. How do you get that to work well? How do you get that in, in two scenarios? One, 
Can y'all hear? hear him? Huh? Oh, he's oh, giving the mic. Yeah, yeah, well, and how do you get that to work well? And in two scenarios, one, your, your church is growing or you're trying to grow and you have a volunteer base. Yes. It's not really there. Then on the other side of that, you know you need to make a shift and all that good stuff. And so how do you resolve that tension or what needs to happen, you know, as far as making a shift from volunteer to staff or whatever, you know, to kind of get that to work? Because that's very frustrating. Yeah. So, so, so two things. One, you said making that, getting that to work, that tension to work. And then you said making the shift from volunteer to staff. Is that a different issue? Two issues. Okay. So, so let me talk about the tension between leaders and managers or the tension between, here's, here's one way of looking at it, a dreamer and a problem solver. Most people are by nature problem solvers. And so the majority of the people in this room solve problems. In fact, they get excited about solving a problem. The people who are not wired that way are excited about opportunities and goals, like we can move the ball downfield. One is offense, one is defense. The reason why y'all won the Super Bowl, you could say all you want, was your defense. At the end of the day, they had that boy, he needed a hug after the game. Cam Newton still is, he still ain't counseling over what y'all did to that kid. That was defense. They had an old quarterback who couldn't even make the throws anymore. So let's, let's, let's not be cute about it. That was defense. Every organization got to have good defense. Defense keeps the offense from scoring. It, 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 it covers the breaches in the organization. It, 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 it closes the gaps. And what I'm saying is the first level of lim eliminating tension is to begin to elevate our value of those kinds of people. Because most leaders don't appreciate them. They look at them like, oh, she's just a dream killer. Mm. Pauline problem solver or <laughs> point out. So, so what I do is, what I do is whenever I'm sharing a, uh, an idea, because I'm an idea guy, I actually ask for the problem solvers to shoot it down because I'm going somewhere. Yeah. Because they might point out a, an issue that I hadn't thought about. Yeah. But what I challenge every problem solver to do is say, I'm so glad, Sister Jackson, you caught that because I had not even thought about that. Isn't that brilliant? Y'all telling her, everybody, Isn't that, wasn't that one why she pointed that out? Because, because, but what I do is I say, and by the next meeting, I'm looking forward to every solution you have to that problem so we can keep this thing moving. Yeah. Wow. 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 That's your job. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Pastor, I got that. We don't have to stop right here. What you've identified is a landmine that we need to be aware of, that we haven't considered. You don't, you don't always, the way, it's the way problems, because if you, don't, if you don't give them, they don't have to have their way, they need to have their say though. And if you don't give voice to people who are different than you, then they'll become silent in the meeting and have a post-meeting conversation about everything we talked about. Y'all know about that meeting? You know what that mean, Bishop? It's the meeting in the parking lot. That still, they act like they praying and worshiping, but they really around, they really around Joe's car talking about what was crazy in the meeting. And you close the meeting and say, are there any questions? Are there any concerns? Is all hearts and minds clear? We said all that. Then they at the car. Be at the car when you leave. An hour later, they still out there. I know that car. I walk past that car. Because the whole thing changed when you walk past that car. Here come. I want everybody to talk up in the meeting. I give voice. I think that's a great, a great challenge you raised. Great, great. Isn't that wonderful? Who else got something to complain? Not complain about. Who has something to point out? Yes, sir. I'm going, you all right, man? You tiptoeing? <laughs> I'm ADD, you can't do that on me. See, he came here like this. Oh, obvious, you got a belt on, ain't you tiptoeing? What's up, man? Yeah, all right, all right. Amen. When you're, <laughs> he coming here with that on, he may be doing, so when you're, The value is in your voice. 
that you have voice at the table. Yes, yes. That your, your words have weight. Yeah. That's why you're here in the room. Yeah. Like I didn't pick you to just do whatever I want to do. That's good, preacher. Yeah. You're at the table because you, you, I trust you. Yeah. Your voice has value. Your words have weight. And, you, and sometimes, if nothing else, you made me pause and go back and pray some more. Now, you can't have 10 elders or 10 leaders at a table and there's and six people or four something and four, we know we don't have unanimity. There must be somebody that emerges to say, this is what we're going to go with. With all the information that we have, and I think, I think in an organization, somebody that's leading has to have that respect from the organization to say, now I'm going to take into consideration all that you all have said. And then I got to make a final decision. I got to make a decision. Can I talk about decisions? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me use this, this flip chart. Because I'm going to come back to the staffing thing too. Yeah. What I'm saying is a lot of it has to do with understanding who's in the room and evaluating the people in the room for their differences. Decision. I love this word. Is that going to bring it out some? Bring them out, bring them out. Bring them out. You all right, Dirk? You know I'm slow, man. I'm slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, buddy. Everybody say decision. decision. Alan Allender has a book called Leading with a Limp. Dan Allender is his name, actually. Dan Allender, Leading with a Limp. He talks about the volatility of the word decision. The, the word decide, the suffix is side. It means to kill, to bring to an end, to put to death. Like homicide means to bring to, to, a, to an end another person's life. Suicide, to bring to an end my own life. Pesticide, to bring pest to an end. Y'all get it? Genocide, the annihilation of a whole culture of people. So side is a volatile word. When you decide something, it means something is coming to an end. And what separates leaders, the great leaders from average leaders, is their capacity to decide. It takes guts to make a decision. Here's it says in the star book, Will thou, Otis, take thee, Valerie, to be your lawful letter, lawfully, letter, lawfully wedded wife? We say something like this. Will you pledge your trust to her alone? When you get married, the black book gets burned. <laughs> it's a decision. It's not just yes to you. It's no to Keisha, Sarah, Latrina, Michelle, Bay Ray. What's all the names you sent me this morning, Pastor? <laughs> <laughs> them new island girls from the islands. Yeah. You, when, you, when you say yes in a meeting, you have to say no to something. And people don't like making decisions because they don't want to upset anybody. And anybody that doesn't have the guts to make the right decisions doesn't have the right to lead. This is the pain of leadership. Yeah. Decisions, yeah. staff decisions. You know when you gotta fire somebody and you're their pastor? Mm. You're their employer yeah. and you're the, you're the CEO and you're the shepherd. They, that's, that's, that's conflicting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a head decision that your heart is conflicted with. Yeah. Yeah. You walk around having a civil war in your own soul. It ain't like being the president of Xerox. You just fire people and you don't see them no more. Get the police to escort them. <laughs> Get them a severance. Yeah. These people, you done baptized and married the daughter. Yeah, yeah. They'll be back at church Sunday and lay a Bible study, but the position has outgrown them. Yeah. 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 And some people need to be fired, yeah. but we reward faithfulness and ignore incompetence. Yeah. So we got people in leadership that don't even fit where we are. Forget about where we're going. Yeah, yeah. Woo. You got the right person from then. You got the right one for then. Yeah, for then, yeah. Wow, wow. But we don't have the courage to make a Because if you're going to decide, you got to bring them to an end. 
and you want to run a church. You got to be crazy to do this, or call, or a combination of the two. Amen. Yes, sir. So I'm going to come back to the staff in terms of, am I, is this helpful to anybody? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Ask Buck, what's his name, Buck Showwater? What's the manager for the Orioles' name? Is that his name? <laughs> Decision. Sometimes it ain't the right one. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, I just wrote a book. I'm going to put another plug in for my book. I wrote a book about bad decisions I made. It's available today. I should be in here. I'll sign it for you. I wrote a book about bad decisions. Um, one is, you get better with age. You do. A lot of reckless decisions are made when you're younger and immature. I think the problem with getting older is you're, you're slower to pull the trigger, mm. which can be bad too. You hold the gun too long, you miss opportunities because opportunities are windows. Mm. They open and they close. Yeah. So you gotta have the kind of dexterity that keeps you nimble enough to make decisions that are, that are swift, but you gotta, that's an alpha. Mm -hmm. Decision is alpha, but getting feedback is omega. So you got to trust people to know what you're thinking about so that they have voice into it without being intimidated that they're going to talk you out of it. But wanting what's ultimately best. I think that's how you make better decisions. And when you make a bad one, you got to own it. Humility owns it when I've blown it. That's what humility does. I tell my sons, I said, listen, you know, we can talk when you mess up. Because when you mess up, you're in the majority. When you fess up, you're in a minority. That's the problem with leaders. I think, I think one of the things that, that hurts people that follow leaders is they follow leaders who won't own up when they've blown it. It's as if there's a level of insecurity that won't let them be vulnerable. But, but some people won't even believe you as a leader until you're vulnerable. Think about Thomas. Thomas was pretty much a staff atheist. <laughs> he was on staff and uh, didn't believe. He was on staff. That's when you know you got the wrong staff person. They don't believe nothing. <laughs> then Thomas said, watch what, watch, but watch what made him believe. He says, I'm not going to believe that Jesus rose from the dead until I can put my hand in his wounds. I need to put my hand in the hole in his hands and in his side, right? Yeah. And Jesus didn't judge him. You know what Jesus did? Showed up and said, put it right here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm willing. Oh, God, that's good. Yeah. 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 Because, because it had been a few days since Jesus had died. Yeah. Yeah. So those wounds were healing. Yeah. Yeah. So if, I put you, if you put your hand in it, you're going to break the scab. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it hurts to open some stuff back up. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just getting over it. And you want me to open it up again? But if it'll help you believe. I'm willing to expose my, 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 my wounds. People need a wounded leader that's willing to say, I'm scarred too. I'm scarred too. So, so I think when you, to answer the question is, is when somebody makes a bad decision to own it. My bad, y'all. I shouldn't have said that. That was a mistake. Think about the leaders in the Bible. I just did a series on kings in the Bible. Just think of how many leaders, if they is just, just like Saul. Like, dude, just, tell, just admit it. You was tripping. When you did the sacrifice, you sacrificed. You didn't want to wait till nighttime. You said, seven, it's seven days and Samuel not here. I'm going to sacrifice for myself. Samuel confronts him about it and said, what are you doing? Oh, man, you didn't show up on time. It's always people who are immature always blame others for their failures. 
So when he was supposed to, when Samuel, when Saul was supposed to kill the Amalekites and destroy everybody, he brought Agag home, brought nice sheep home. He brought all this stuff home that he wanted. And then Samuel confronts him about it and says, what's up? He says, I obey the Lord. He says, what's this bleeding of the sheep? He said, oh, we was, that, my staff did that. They did that. And we was going to worship the Lord with it anyway. Can you, he just says, shut up, man. Just stop it. Stop it. You know what? Saul was so unwilling to admit his failures that God said this. God says, I repent that I made him king. Oh, wow. He wasn't the only king that had messed up, but he was certainly one that wouldn't own it. Now, when David would get broken, he write Psalms and we still reading about it. <laughs> he'd be, David was a hot mess. He'd be all on the floor crying. I'm sorry, I purged me with his. <laughs> you know what it means to be purged with his. That hurts. Yes, ma'am. How are we on time? Because my watch ain't working. It just matched my outfit. <laughs> this just, this just for the looks. This joke don't work. <laughs> it's just, it said this been in nine twenty one for like the last six months. Yes, ma'am. So how much? So, so just before you ask this, how much time do we have though? Uh, we got, so we got, we, we got, started late. It's ten thirty, but I was gonna. That's fine, and then a break, yeah, okay. And then a break, yeah. okay. I'm Omega right now, Jesus. Woo! You following? I'm following, man. Nice, yeah. nice. Yeah. So how do you leave the broken one? How do I what? Leave the broken Because it's right twice a day. Join what no. Don't make me hoop right here. Everything about me broken. <laughs> hey Amen. I don't have a belt. I left my belt home. I feel like my son. My pants sagging. And stuff. I love it. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looking at the heart. Yes, ma'am. She's had her hand up for a while. Stop interrupting, Lynn. <laughs> Hold one second. Sure. This is being recorded, isn't it? Yeah. So you want to get the questions on mic? Okay. So we probably should do that. I'm sorry. Oh, I can repeat it. Yeah, yeah. You want to do that? Okay. So you as a... Absolutely. Absolutely. That's excellent. I agree with you wholeheartedly. You start with God. So he could, because sometimes it's, it's with God that he reveals to us our mistake. You go back to the people we've hurt. And I like this. What's your name, Pastor? What's your name? Pastor Sinise. Here's a, I would like to add one thing to what you said. I, and you actually said this, but I think people need to apologize in the same context that they failed. So, 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 so I had a situation one time where my assistant pastor at the time, um, I started a church for unchurched people, which I think is the best way to do church planting. The reason why it's just, it ain't even deep, it's, it's statistical. The Bible says many are, the wide is the road that leads to destruction, many are on that road, and straight is the way, narrow is the gate that leads to life, and few that be to find it. So just numerically, there are more lost people in Denver and Aurora than there are saved people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I did was, I just said, I'm going after unsaved, unchurched people. Yeah. They ain't got no church background. They don't know what I'm doing wrong anyway, because they ain't got nothing to compare to. <laughs> they don't know we ain't supposed to touch the communion table. We're supposed to have on white gloves and a red tie and a black suit, white shirt. Yeah, yeah. And march in with the offer. They don't know we're supposed to do all that. <laughs> they ain't know I ain't supposed to wear jeans in church. They don't know none of that. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. So we went after unchurched people. 
We had a 60 minute service. We did contemporary music and I did a clear practical message. I have, I have an overhead projector up. This was back in the overhead projector days. Yeah. So I had an assistant pastor that came out of a holiness church. It was a, you know, holiness, yeah, like yeah. it was called, yeah. it was called Gateway to Heaven Pentecostal Holiness Church. Right Talk to me. <laughs> you know the service in that church, that's, that's joint six hours. They start service at 11, they be out the game over. Be like five o'clock, run around. With, so, so he came out of that background. So he would be in the meeting saying, yeah, I'm supporting, I'm doing it because he want to do this, but if, we, if I ever get a church, we're going to have robes. I'm going to wear a cassock. Because he, you know, he wanted to wear the clergy robes and all the, all the garb and all that. And so he would say it like periodically in front of all the leaders. And he was one of the most influential leaders in our church. So I said to him one time, I said, you know, it's okay that we disagree like that. But when you put it out like that, when I'm trying to move a church into being a seeker sensitive lost for lost people to church, when you say that, it deflates leaders who I'm trying to change their thinking about how we reach people. Yeah. He said, I'm so sorry. He called me and says, can I, can I speak at the next leadership meeting? This will be on our fourth Saturday leadership meeting. He said, call me and apologize. I said, for what? He says, I want to apologize for what I said. I said, wait, 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 you, you said that to me. You didn't say that to them. He says, he says, I want to apologize in the same context I failed. See, what too many people want to do is you want to cuss somebody out in front of everybody in the break room, but then you want to find them in the parking lot and say, you know, I was just like, that's just what I, no, no, go back in the break room, get Keisha, get Maurice, get John, and everybody, and say, bring the whole environment back. You want to cuss the coach out and then apologize to the coach, but then get back on the stream. No, you cuss the coach out in practice in front of everybody. You need to run sprints in front of everybody. Come back to the coach with your mama. They put that in your head. That's called owner, owning your stuff. So you should always try to make retribution. It's not just repentance, it's retribution. What can I repay for what I've done? If I can, if I can fix it. Making reparations to the level that I can. That's excellent. That's a part of, that's that omega side of leadership. Jesus, we don't have him recorded apologizing because he never sinned. That ain't our story. There ain't a day to go by that we don't sin in word, deed, thought, action. Or how about this? Something we should have said that we didn't say. Something we should have did that we didn't do. It's sins of omission. We got a whole list. You can do a, like a, a three piece with dirty rice. Just got a number four. I did it. I did. I said something wrong today. I should have said I sorry. I ain't say that. I didn't call the person. We just we so we we got plenty to apologize for. And if you preach out of your own failure, you'll always have plenty of material. <laughs> you'll never run out of something to say because you blow. We blow it all the time. All right. Who else had the hand up? Or we good? Uh, let's, let's talk about staffing for a couple of minutes. How do you go from volunteer to staff? When do you know when to make that transition? Somebody's a volunteer? First of all, you only staff people when your growth requires it, your vision demands it, and your resources will support it. Should I say that again? Your growth requires it, your vision demands it, and your resources will support it. Now I said the resources support it last because I have hired people by faith because I knew they were the right person and the resources went up when they came on. I've seen it happen. The organization is too big and complicated to do faith hires now, but when we were early, we were doing faith hires. And it worked. I told the people when we hired, we ain't even got the money to pay you. But I believe you come on this team, the money, and I'm telling you, the money would go up when the game on staff. We ain't even announce it that we need a bigger offering. I I think there's so much I want to say about this 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 that I'd like to carry it over into our time at the yeah. break. Yeah. But I will say this: the staff is so important because whenever whenever God was going to do a miracle with Moses, it was always connected to his staff. So when, 
when Moses is about to go before Pharaoh and Pharaoh has a bunch of magicians in his, in his camp, God says, well, what's in your hand? And he says, throw it on the ground. It became a snake. And he said, pick it back up. It became a staff again. So that was pretty cool. So Moses went in there doing tricks like that. <laughs> but his miracles happened when he said. When you remember when the, when the Israelites were running from the Egyptian army and they got down to the Red Sea and they couldn't go any further and Pharaoh's army's coming? Yeah. You know what God said when Moses was like, what are we going to do? You know what God told Moses? He says, stretch your staff. Whenever God's going to do a miracle in your ministry, you've got to you stretch your staff. Wow. Wow. That's good. And the way you stretch them is you've got to expose them to a higher level of ministry and insight. Wow. Too many pastors are eating at tables that their leaders aren't eating at. You've got to feed your people at the level you're eating. Yes. Otherwise, they'll be traumatized by your exposure. So you come back and you've been exposed and you've been elevated and you went to a conference and you got all this insight and then you try to bring it back to people who are still eating crackers. Yeah, yeah. And you didn't have caviar. Yeah, yeah. So it's wise. I love it when leaders bring their, there's no place my pastors can't go with me. I love it when leaders have the foresight, I'm going to this conference and y'all going with me. Too many leaders are so either they don't have the expansive vision to do it, or they're too insecure to say, I want to get the information first and then come back and teach it or whatever. No, let them be exposed to what you're being exposed to. Yeah, yeah. Because you stretch your staff through exposure. Nice, 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 nice. Taking them out of the limitation of the circumference of what is normal. You got me? That's it? We can break? So, no, no, we got time. I want to ask a question. You lying about that time. I know you are. <laughs> you got four minutes. Okay, good. Uh, is that part of being then Omega when, because I think people, leaders do that in corporate America, church, where they want to get all the information first and then teach it, as you just said. Sure. And they don't want to be exposed because there's some kind of, this person's going to rise right. over me. Mm-hmm. And therefore, I need to keep everybody kind of in their place. Yeah. So, so here's the secret sauce. So you said, we all talk about my church growing. Yeah. I told my brother coming here, I said, he asked me to do it. I hate talking about my church because I don't want to yeah. sound ostentatious on any level. Because what we did is simple. I think it'll work for anybody. But here's one thing I'll share that we did. My church grew exponentially when I started giving away leadership. Mm. I've yeah. given my leadership away. Yeah. Yeah. The, and I gave it, I intentionally gave it away to people younger than me. Yeah. It's called generational leadership. So every generation is about 20 years. So think about your age right now. You need to be pouring into somebody 20 years younger than you. So the guy that runs my church is 34 years old. He runs it. His name is James Marshall. I remember when he was a kid coming up for children's church, he, I was, he, he didn't have all his teeth in his mouth. <laughs> He runs the organization. That was a major moment because it freed me up to do what I do best. So it's a big difference between pastoring, pastoring a flock and shepherding leaders. Yeah. 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 You want great leaders. Yeah. He is better than me at a lot of stuff. Yeah. A lot of stuff. But because he's better than me, doesn't mean he's going to replace me. Yeah. You understand? That's, just, that's, just, that's, just, that's, just, that's knowing where you are. Even if he succeeds me one day, he didn't replace me. Yeah. There's a difference. Yeah, 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 yeah. I cannot be replaced. You can't be me. Yeah, yeah. You understand? Yeah. You can only do what I did as you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can do my whole assignment, but you can't be me. Because right, right. whatever I go to next is going to be an elevation. I'm, you, you, even if you retire, you ain't getting demoted. You're retiring to probably help somebody else. Right, right, right. right. So, so I think... The, the, the secret is organizations grow exponentially. Jesus said, Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Yeah. We don't have a harvest problem. There are plenty of people. We got a laborer problem. Yeah. 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 So guess what Jesus said do to solve that problem? Let me tell you what we do. The Bible says the harvest is plenty, plentiful, laborers are few. What we do is we make the pastor give an announcement. Put out a flyer, go on social media. You know what God said to do in Matthew chapter 9? 
pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send forth laborers into his harvest. So as we pray and watch and build up teams and leaders, I think it's the opposite. I want my leaders to exceed my skill set. But as I keep growing, the problem is, is having leaders that are not growing. And you can't be growing, you're not growing if you're not reading, you're not listening to somebody, you're not following somebody's blog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leaders are readers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I ask you what you're reading, you say I read the Denver Post, yeah, yeah. the sports section. Yeah. <laughs> you need to step down. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's gotta be something that's, cause that means you, 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 you was the right person. Yeah. <laughs> You were the right person when we were looking for somebody that was just faithful. Oh, get Joe to do it. He's faithful. He's here every Sunday. That's how we pick people. You don't have to be competent. Don't have to be thorough. Don't have to be excellent. Don't have to match the level of the ministry. Just faithful. And we don't set him down because he's faithful. Because we don't want to make a... I must have hit something that's, that's for this church because y'all got looking real serious right now. It reminds me of that table. Remember that table when Jesus said, one of y'all going to betray me. Can you imagine that table? Because you know, they know that Jesus knows. So they start, hey, Lord, is, it ain't me, is it? It ain't me, is it? They're going to ask you during the break. It ain't me, is it, Pastor? It ain't me, is it? Amen. 